Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd like to commence these proceedings by acknowledging the elders, families and descendants of the Wurundjeri people who have been and are the custodians of these lands. We acknowledge the land in which we meet was the place of age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal, and that the local Aboriginal peoples here have, uh, have had and continue to have a unique role in the life of these lands. Uh, good evening. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure, apparently it says you say pleasure, uh, the pleasure of meeting me, uh, my name's Andrew Hudson. I'm the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning here at the University of Melbourne. And it's my great pleasure, back to you, to welcome you uh, to this wonderful event on behalf of the faculty. I also extend the welcome to any students, staff, guests, and especially our valued alumni uh, who are here as part of our community. Uh, tonight, we are very fortunate to be joined by a stellar panel of industry experts for the discussion entitled, Avoiding Green Lemons, the Value of Green Building, the Past, Present and the Future. This highly irrelevant conversation has been deliberately programmed within this year's program of events which celebrates 150 years of built environment education here at the University of Melbourne. The aptly titled BE 150, uh, the year-long program will feature events, competitions, exhibitions, as well as digital and print-based content initiatives. This program celebrates uh, the theme, how have our alumni, staff and students impacted Melbourne and the world, and how will we? It's a celebration of legacy and impact, but it is also an exercise in looking forward and examining the significant challenges that face us and our disciplines into the future. Tonight's discussion, uh, which examines recent and future trends in sustainability and the green building movement, aligns brilliantly with these aspirations for these year-long celebrations. It is now my pleasure to hand over to Dr Georgia Warren Myers, a senior lecturer in property here at the University of Melbourne. Georgia will be our chair for this evening's discussions and she will introduce our panel and get the proceedings underway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. So, welcome everyone. Um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, my name's Dr. Georgia Warren Myers and I'm a senior lecturer in property here at the University of Melbourne. I've spent about the last decade researching the relationship between sustainability and value in the commercial and residential real estate areas and have developed new perspectives and implications for valuation, investment and management over that period. Tonight is my pleasure to welcome four awesome speakers who each bring their own perspective to the sustainability and green value discussion. So we have tonight Richard Bowman, Anthony D. Francesco, Nina James and Franz First. So the agenda for this evening is to consider what we thought a decade ago, how the industry and its practitioners have developed and changed over this period, what its current state of play is and what poses the next big challenges and opportunities for the industry, the built environment and its professionals. So most importantly, to consider what are green lemons and how do we strategically avoid these and how do we ensure that today's assets don't end up tomorrow's green lemons. So I would like to welcome Richard Bowman to the lectern. Richard is a property valuer with over 25 years of experience and he is a fellow of the Australian Property Institute and a member of RICS. He has been a partner in the real estate advisory team at EY where he undertakes valuation and advises on new development projects for the sector. Richard was an early contributor on the topic of sustainability in property and authored Valuing Green with the GBCA in 2008. The document investigated the concepts of how green buildings affect value and getting the valuation method right. So Richard will take a look back at what was being forecast at the time and did he and the industry get it right? Thank you. Thanks, and uh, good evening, everybody, and um, Georgia, thanks very much for the invite uh, to talk this evening. Um, and thanks very much for the kind use of the photo, too, which uh, probably dates back to about when I was first involved in, uh, in the topic of green buildings, which was really around about sort of 2005, 2006. And um, I was acting as a, uh, and still do, as a property valuer in Melbourne, and really looking at uh, commercial, commercial valuations. And, 
And the topic of green buildings was really in its infancy. Um, and, and I was very interested in, in how this evolution might start to flow through to, to property values and property assets. And was approaching this from a financial point of view. And um, we, we got underway probably with some work uh, first up with the GBCA, with Romilly Madhu, and, and probably any of you who are involved in the industry would know Romilly. And she authored this document uh, called uh, The Dollars and Cents of Green Buildings, to which I had some input into and, and was, um, was you know, uh, sort of well distributed at the time. In about 2008, we got involved in another project called Valuing Green. Um, and John Mills and I took a specific look at, you know, what was the likely, or what could we tell from the valuation of these assets that was flowing through to their financial performance, be it through, uh, you know, savings in operating expenses, impact on valuation, um, you know, impact on rent. Um, and then in uh, 2013, uh, some further academics got involved to produce the document called Building Better Returns. And at that time I was acting as one of the steering group members and guiding some of the research in the areas that I thought needed some further investigation. So in those early years, um, I suppose there was a couple of things that are the takeaways um, uh, from those early pieces of work. I think the first was that really our focus was predominantly on, on, on commercial assets. Um, there was a bit of work being done around residential. It wasn't my focus area, but uh, I, was, I was much more interested in commercial. The other thing, we re never really cracked the nut around retail or, or around industrial. Um, uh, commercial was much easier, it was much more transparent market. The second thing is that um, in hindsight what we were doing is we weren't actually really measuring how green buildings were performing, we were actually forecasting because we didn't have the data built up to go back and, and do some really good empirical evidence. So, um, we did some survey work with uh, buyers and sellers of those assets and we asked how we thought that they would actually end up, end up pricing those assets. Um, we took a good look at you know, what are the valuation methodologies that we needed in order to, to value those assets. There was a lot of talk at the time that valuers weren't appropriately equipped and we needed to come up with some new valuation method. We pretty quickly def defunct that situation and, 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 and realised that a, a traditional DCF model that has all of those explicit um, assumptions around rental growth rates, capex, terminal yields, all of those types of things that you need to price assets, was actually quite an appropriate tool. Um, so, uh, so we pushed back heavily um, as a valuation industry against that. And um, finally, we were really looking at measurement of the impact of sustainability, or certainly through the work I was doing, at the asset level. Um, it's moved much more past that these days, and we'll hear from you know, the likes of Nina about how it's being picked up and, 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 and transported into what I'll call sustainability sort of at the, in, at the entity level. Um, some of the survey work which we were doing back in 2008 um, uh, involved questions to industry practitioners. So these are, these are mainly, um, I shouldn't say practitioners, sorry, I should say uh, asset owners. So you think of the likes of the AMPs, the ISPTs, the investors, um, all of the groups who are, who are frequently owning and trading assets. And I asked the, the, the teams who are buying and selling these assets, what are the likely areas where you think sustainability will filter through and change the way which you price these assets. And these were the, these were the sort of the, the, the feedback, um, although the, sorry, the questions around the topic are on the left hand side and the feedback is measured by the bars. I just want to draw out a couple of quick observations here. The further to the right which these dark bars go, the less likelihood that, they, that people, th oh, sorry, the greater the likelihood that people thought that those factors would impact on value. Further uh, to the left, such as commencing rental, they didn't, they, they, those people were saying, look, we don't think, for example, that commencing rent will actually, be, um, will actually be factored through into the valuation of the asset. If we, look, if we sort of um, self-assess today, um, my view is that we got some of these things right at the time when we were forecasting, but we also got some of these things horribly wrong. Um, for example, um, commencing rent. There was a strong feeling back at the time that tenants weren't prepared to pay more to lease a green building. Well, that's actually, um, from my practitioner's point of view, turned out to be quite the opposite. People are pricing um, the cost of sustainability into the design and construction of a building and are willing to pay for it. 
And how do I know that? I know that because every time I pick up a new project and have a look at the specifications of that project, I know that we that they are um, that they are uh, actually um, willing to pay for that and are not stripping that out of the value of the asset. Um, so. At the time, we were sort of saying, OK, well, look, if we know these areas where it's being impacted, we can then measure them in terms of what is their likely value um, uh, increase on the asset. And whilst we were sort of talking at the time in the reports of just sort of 5 to 10 per cent, we could break that down into its component parts and look at things like renewal probability, leasing downtime, terminal yield and rental growth rate. So if we... Um, have a look at the uh, sort of the early work. Then I'd say, what did we sort of um, fail to sufficiently identify? Well, back at the time, we were never really identifying um, the likely importance of um, the movement of global capital and how that was going to shape the value of the asset. Um, uh, people making decisions on where they would put their money and where they would take their money out of was really beginning to shape the capital markets. Um, the degree to which sort of corporate tenants and government tenants were willing to um, mandate the need to occupy green buildings was, um, was probably uh, uh, insufficiently identified. Um, uh, but I think the probably, uh, probably where we also got it wrong was that buildings, um, once they were sustainability rated, they were likely to be future proof, that those tenants would stay longer um, uh, than in a, in a green building than in a non-green building. Um, and finally, uh, um, I just want to highlight the point of um, the ability to be able to transact, to be able to analyse a transaction. We really thought at the time that you could dissect the sale of a real estate transaction and isolate which part of it had a uh, had an impact on uh, on uh, the green credentials had an impact on the price. To be honest, there's so many things going on in a large real estate transaction. You've got the price, you've got the tenant, you've got the timing in the market. You've got the location of the asset. You've got a million different things happening, and, and slicing it down to green impact is actually a very difficult thing to do through through that whole negotiation process. So quickly, what did we get right? Um, the built environment is a major contributor, and the trend to reduce uh, emissions is on. Um, sustainability would su would sustain the likes of a GFC, uh, and uh, finally, the sustainability. Um, would become a mainstay in all property investment decision making and uh, one day uh, may rank on par with uh, financial decision making. So thank you for that very brief look back. I'll hand back to Georgia and um, we'll have the opportunity, I think, to go through a few questions later in the uh, presentation. Yes, so thanks very much. Thank you very much, Richard. So now I'd like to present Anthony DeFrancesco. Anthony is the director and founder of Real Investment Analytics. He provides analytical and research services for real estate investment. Anthony has over 15 years of experience in various research roles and developed the Sustainability Reporting Index, created benchmarks, and also provided key evaluation metrics for the industry. Whilst he was the managing director at IPD Australia and later as executive director of MSCI. In particular, he was involved in creating an ability to link asset performance measures to the NABAS and Green Star ratings for commercial property. So Anthony will take a look back at the evolution of the performance reporting and evaluation processes and examine the new challenges the industry faces going forward. Thank you. Thank you, George. Okay, so, oops. here we go. So look, I thought the starting point here would be just to give a bit of a backdrop in terms of where we where have we come from in terms of evaluation process on sustainability. So I've sort of taken it back to about 2000 and there was a lot of discussion back then about the value proposition of the underlying premise about sustain, sustainability in buildings or green buildings. And it's probably fair to say the whole industry basically was convinced and said yes there is a value proposition here that makes sense. Um, and the question then became, how do we validate it? How do we quantify it? How do we identify it? So it wasn't, there wasn't any issue with the premise, it was about how to actually put substance and context behind it. So I think that's where we were in the early 2000s. The mid-2000s, we saw some of the rating labels come out. 
two key areas where this happened. One was in terms of Neighbours and Green Star, and it was, you know, it was rating labels on energy and water and sort of you know, the environmental aspects of the building. One at the asset level, and then we also saw Gres. And Gres, the point here is that Gres was focused more at the fund or the portfolio level. So we had two distinct types of labels that were actually aimed at different aspects um, in terms of looking at sustainability with the context of buildings. Um, towards the, then we see there was a movement towards um, consumption sort of variable. So apart from the labels, there actually were um, some of a lot of the property companies were actually gathering information on energy consumption, dealing with individual um, assets as well. So we saw that information set come to life as well. Um, towards the 2010, you know, I was involved in his where um, you know IPD at the time um, before we got taken over by MCI, we actually focused on look, we need to bring some sort of quantification to the market, and that's what sort of drove us to bring sort of a green index to the market, um, where we wanted to link some of the labels with some of the performance measures or sort of investment metrics to see if there was a correlation or some sort of, um, or gave scope then for causation. What we then saw, so, you know, towards the mid-2010s, we see there's an evolution of these metrics away from sort of investment focus, but now more the occupancy focus of buildings. So how do we actually measure the utilisation of space? Or how are we getting value of that space itself? Rather, so, there's, so there's a whole series of focus now on interior space, right? Um, and today, it's more about the evaluation focus more holistically. So what we see, there's a gradual sort of evolution in terms of evaluation from a more micro and more sort of granular to now that it's more sort of encompassing um, and more holistic. We're not there yet, but that's the trend in terms of where we're moving. So that's what that slide's all about. Um, so we can talk about more of that on the, on the panel. Okay, so let's just quickly focus on when we talk about sort of evaluation, what are we sort of referring to? What aspect of the building or the investment? And these are terms which are thrown away quite sort of loosely, but what I've done here, just to give a bit of a context where a lot of the activity or focus, um, if you, this is more of a tier diagram in terms of giving an overview in terms of corporate, um, sort of the investment platform, the portfolio and funds, and down to the asset level. So it gives you a tier overview in terms of the spectrum of investment, but it nicely sort of articulates where there's been a lot of activity in terms of sort of the quantification or labelling. It's been down at this level, portfolio and property. And we have seen also sort of, you know, with the UNPRI a more sort of more strategic overlay. So this is linkage going on with all these sort of reporting and metrics. Um, coming down more sort of to the tangibility in terms of well, what are sort of some of the sort of key measures or areas where we've where we've seen the industry focus on to try to sort of highlight the value proposition. Um, and I've highlighted three sort of segments in terms of aspects in terms of where the industry from different, um, from different players have sort of tackled this. So one is basically the ownership, so it's investment performance, spatial utilisation, and I've briefly spoken about that, and also space management and more about the operational efficiency. So across all those axioms, so three axioms, we've seen a series of measures where um, there's been studies on to try to highlight sort of this green credentials or green premium. So we'll get back to that on the, um, I guess, on the panel. Um, just to share some results that we've put together. So there have been studies both ad hoc and more structural. So I would say sort of the IPD stuff's been more structural. But more recently, what I went out and sort of, I, I sort of, again, just to highlight this tangible connection, looked at label ratings on certain buildings and then looked at various sort of performance measures and see is there a linkage. So this shows you quite clearly just for the neighbours, zero to four star and then four to six star, where you've got this segmentation of performance. And it's what you would expect. So you can see there on cap rates, there's firmer cap rates for the high energy rated labels, it's lower and it's and it's and it's tighter and it's Obviously, the cap rate is higher for the lower energy ratings. The asset price per square metre, you can see there, it's distinctly higher 
for the high-end neighbours, lower for the low-end neighbours. Um, occupancy rates are higher, once again, you can see also that for whale, they're higher as well. So there's a sort of, um, there's nothing surprising in that, I mean, that's what we would expect from sort of the, you know, all the discussions and sort of the, um, I guess, the type of conjecture that we say about how we sort of see sustainability come through. The other thing I've done with this other chart, and I I'm running out of time, but we need to say, it's not enough to look at this stuff in granular. We've got to segment this by market because markets actually have their own dynamics, their own performance drivers. So we need to segment the, the, the data set as well. So this is where you, know, you can get caught up in the detail, but if you don't do that, bring all the data together to some extent may sort of make the results or the, uh, a little bit elusive. I just wanted to finish off with one slide on climate change. Um, and this is where, and look, you know, there's a lot of debate about this and we can sort of get that on the panel, but the point here is um, if we're going to look at climate change, we're going to look at it holistically within a broad framework. And what I've done here is just really given a bit of a, a, an insight in terms of, well, what could that framework look like? And it's more of a risk framework. What are the common sort of risk factors? What are the specific risk factors? But then how does that actually sort of lead into risk assessment? And I think the key points there are you know, strategies around sort of adaptation, mitigation, but the other important aspect on the pricing side is about the risk premium. What is that green risk premium? Um, I'm running out of time, so I think I might just leave it there. Thank you, and we'll talk more on the panel. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anthony. So I'd now like to welcome Nina James to the lectern. So Nina's career maps a journey from a landscape architecture background with a segue into the sustainability in land development aspect and then later into commercial real estate to currently finding herself launching Australia's first certified property Kanga Green Bonds and Loans. As General Manager of Corporate Sustainability and Investor Property Group, Nina was responsible for strategic direction of the sustainability vision for Investor encompassing people, environment and responsible investment objectives. Nina is responsible for delivering investors net zero by 2040 target, including the engagement of 100,000 plus occupants and 14,000 investors in the transition to a carbon positive future. Nina will now look at the evolution of sustainability managers and the role and how that is going to change in the future. Thank you, Nina. Hi everybody. So um, I willfully volunteered or vol got voluntold that I was speaking tonight. Um, but when I found out that the subject was about um, sustainability practitioners, that's something that I'm really excited to talk about. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, yep, that's my first slide. Good. Okay. So what I wanted to talk to you about first was maybe ask you a question. What do you think a sustainability manager looks like? Given what Richard and Anthony have just sprinted through, my challenge to you is to imagine what does a sustainability manager look like now and maybe what did they look like 10 years ago? Because there's a list, that's my list of people I know that are in sustainability and their backgrounds. And as Georgia referenced, I was a landscape architect for 20 years. My expertise was in recreation planning and council development. And now I find myself in meetings with Macquarie Bank talking about terminal asset values, which I had to look that up last week. I have a constant state of fraud syndrome where I have no place being in that room because I know nothing about what they're talking about, but it gives me a lot of license to ask a lot of strange questions. Equally recently, I learned that a holiday on an interest rate is a reduced interest rate. Why do they call it a holiday interest rate? It was my question. So I just wanted to challenge you to say um, that where Anthony and Richard have sprinted through how sustainability developed, I want you to think about what does that look like when you are the person trying to deliver on it when the game keeps moving. So it might feel like a bit of a marathon, actually, um, I'm often tired is how I <laughs> feel about this, but I really wanted to raise the point that actually both um, Richard and Anthony referenced was that the Olympics changed our world in terms of what Australia does in sustainability. It ensured that we developed industry capacity and understanding, it tapped into our eagerness to get involved in this game. Um, and then what we saw is shortly after that Richard and Romilly uh, produced their report in terms of dollars and cents. And again, we had a game changer. All of a sudden, I could walk into a meeting room and throw that report on the table and say, it makes good business sense, now we have to do it. 
So I think I'm um, underselling slightly what you did, but um, we're very, very grateful. Um, it feels like a bit of a, a marathon, but in 2016, um, we had the Paris Agreement come through. And a lot of people in this room might be thinking, what on earth has that got to do with a sustainability manager? Um, so let me tell you what changed my world again. It meant that all of a sudden my organisation took a look at that and said, what does that mean for us? If global organisations are going to take a position on climate change, what does that mean for our global attraction of investors? So from being someone who had maybe an environmental background, I had to very quickly develop a financial background and understand how to say things like interest rate and EBITDA in a sentence without looking like an idiot. Um, so what that meant for us really is that Paris meant that we set targets, it meant that there were finance, all of a sudden we were enga engaging investors, and it meant that Australia had to take a position on policy. We can get into that later. Um, the other influencing factor really was around the sustain sustainable development goals, so the 17 goals that drive a broader sense of what the, the globe needs to be doing to address some of these bigger challenges, um, and some of them are around like sustainable communities, um, uh, you know, responsible consumption and production and action on climate change, which is a no-brainer, obviously. The most important one I want to reach uh, to make sure you understand is the global finance migration. Um, so I touched on the dollars and cents being really important, but actually when the finances move, everybody follows. So after the Paris Agreement, there were huge cohorts of um, individuals and corporations that just said, <coughs> right, this climate change thing is real, we are financially exposed, move the money. And as soon as they move the money, we start to go, pick me, pick me, because in real estate, we can talk very um, eloquently, due to the work that Anthony and Richard do, that says, this is how sustainable our portfolio is, and we have real credentials and real certifications that validate that. So we're not just greenwashing. So um, the other influencing factors right now that are driving the way I operate is around, um, unfortunately for me, global, federal, local and state politics. Um, and it's important that we call out that there are some areas that are doing really well and there are some areas that are doing very, very poorly. Um, the good news is that you don't have to get too wrapped up in that because the big corporations in Australia have taken on responsibility and accountability and they are taking action. And my organisation is one of them. Um, I'm also watching global macroeconomic trends, another word I never thought I'd use in a sentence. Um, and that's because I need to understand when we're issuing debt what the global market is doing. It also means I need to understand what's happening in Germany's economy because we source investors from Germany. So if Germany are doing amazing things in real estate, I need to sit in front of those investors and talk eloquently to them about what they're doing. So all of a sudden I'm becoming a kind of shallow generalist across a lot of topics. Um, it's important as well to look at how our customer is responding to this environment. So 100,000 customers in our building every day. Um, and little things like keep cups get them really excited because they feel like they're making a contribution. And I, I know it, at universities, you know, it's faux pas to walk around with a plastic water bottle and it's certainly with a disposable coffee cup. So that gives you an indication of when you scale that up to 100,000, the kind of thing that my organisation has to respond to. Um, most importantly, um, I giggled when I did this. Actually, this looks like my to-do list. Um, these are the kind of really important projects that are happening at the moment. This is where we mark the evolution from Paris and what looks forward for a sustainability manager. My job is to be across all of that at all of one time. Um, that means my job is different every single day and it means that I feel like I'm constantly playing netball and playing defence or offence and I'm never which sure that game is. Um, I think the one that's exciting is sustainable finance at the moment and that's where I feel like the sustainability is having its moment because all of a sudden I can sit in a room and I am bringing in capital. So because of our performance, which is validated by Anthony's many metrics, I can sit in front of investors and say, you should give me your money because I can deploy it in a way that will suit your demand from your customer. And in saying that, don't underestimate where your super sits because those conversations drive the conversations they have with me. Uh, the other important one I wanted to raise was the TCFD. So um, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure is changing my world again. Uh, and that's all about investors understanding their exposure to climate change and the valuation at risk. Um, you've probably read a lot about these disrupting factors, but these things are coming at me, and this is me going to have to change my expertise again. Um, that's fine. There's a lot of opportunity for that in that space for us, again, to be proactive. So I wanted to finish with what a sustainability manager looks like. They're tired, but they're agile, they're generalists and they're specialists. They're definitely strategic and they learn to speak many, many languages in many, many meetings. 
they have to be collaborative to bring everybody with them and they must be resilient when they get told no 800 times, they then have to go for 801. Um, they're absolutely opportunistic because you're not in this game if you don't see the benefit. Um, so that's probably a 20 second snapshot of what could have been a thesis, but I'm very happy to take more difficult questions in the panel. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Nina. So now with our final uh, short presentation before we break into the panel, uh, I would like to welcome Professor Franz first. Franz is a Professor of Real Estate and Urban Economics at the University of Cambridge and Trinity Hall. His expertise is in the area of green real estate economics, financial analysis of sustainable investments, portfolio and risk management and spatial economics. He has authored and co-authored several widely cited and award-winning studies on the economics of green buildings and the economic value of energy efficiency in real estate. In 2016-2017 academic year, he visited the University of Melbourne and he was a fellow here and we undertook some studies uh, looking at green real estate in the Australian context. So we co-wrote a paper examining the mandatory disclosure program in the residential market in the ACT, identifying a whole heap of disclosure issues and problems and the creation of green lemons. So Franz will now take a bit of a look back at how research and the emergence of different relationships from the value perspective as seen from the research side um, and suggest new ideas as to some of the challenges that will face property in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia, for the kind introduction. It's uh, great to be back. As Georgia said, I was a visiting scholar here uh, for a whole year. I guess as the only academic speaker here on the panel, it is an incumbent upon me to actually clarify or answer the question that's on everybody's mind. What on earth are green lemons, right? <laughs> so is it a kind of when life gives you lemons, make green lemonade? Maybe there will be some outside later at the drinks reception. Um, but it really goes back, well, to be honest, it's a term that Georgia and I made up, uh, not entirely, because the, the lemons part of it has been around for quite a while. Actually, it goes back to, to 1970 and a seminal paper by the economist George Akerlof, who later won the Nobel Prize for it. And it essentially, in a nutshell, is the situation that's um, visualized over there on the left-hand side. Whenever you have a market, that is characterized by asymmetric information. So a seller knows more about the product they are selling than a buyer. Then you actually get several effects. And one of them is that buyers don't trust the product. And by not trusting the product, that means that they're lowering their asking prices. So if you don't know, and this goes back to um, the original, goes back to a used car market, and this is Ameri an American colloquialism, a lemon is, basically a, a bad used car. So it might look okay, but it's actually not. It'll break down sooner or later. Um, and Akerlof used the, the, the used car market, but it also applies to the real estate market, especially uh, with regard to the green credentials. And that's why many, many years after the original papers um, on the used car market was uh, published, we observed the same phenomenon in the, in the property market. So the, the other effect, of course, is not just that you get lower prices on average, because buyers and sellers are moving apart. The more asymmetry there is, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, and only a part of the, of the products gets sold, there is also a, a downward spiral that opens up. Because if you're the owner of a peach, the opposite of a lemon, so you've got a good car, a good building that performs well, but you don't get actually the price that you deserve because of the information uncertainty, then you're actually going to withdraw from the market. And the more this happens, the more lemons there will be in the market, the fewer peaches there will be in the market, and you can see where this is going. And if you want to see uh, green lemons in action, that's basically what we see on the right-hand side, the study that Jordan and I did in the ACT, where if you order non-disclosure, so I have to say, um, disclosure of uh, energy efficiency is voluntary in the ACT rental market. And if you then order it by um, the SAFER score, which is essentially ordering um, from uh, left to right in terms of socioeconomic deprivation of areas, uh, then you can clearly see that this problem is, um, 
also exists in in the in, in the market where you have areas with um, that where building stock is lower, socioeconomically disadvantaged renters live, they get hit by this double whammy of uh, lower disclosure and worse building stock. So moving on, um, green value uh, is basically a long agenda, and I won't dwell on this because Anthony and Richard have already talked about the different components of green value, and it's essentially also my research agenda that I've been following for, well, 10 plus years and probably going to follow um, for quite some time. Um, the one thing that I would note on this is that it's been very, a very hard journey, and I think most uh, academics and uh, others who have been studying it um, it would agree, just getting a hold of the data, both on the, the financial performance side, but also on the environmental performance side, uh, is, is quite a big task. So you're almost, as Nina said, you're tired. Uh, part of my tiredness is basically, uh, and my team, is to, to get the data, the right data, clean it, and get to a stage where you can actually start the analysis. So that's still quite hard, and it shouldn't be so hard. And that's essentially my main point of the entire presentation is that um, to avoid green lemons, we really need to open up um, data and, and various data sources. Uh, Ten years ago, maybe there was a reason why the, the data didn't exist. I think um, now it's more a question of bringing the data together and uh, a question of disclosure rather than measuring it. So I'll go over this one really quickly because you can spend a whole evening just showing these graphs of how green outperforms, uh, not just at the individual building level, but also at the portfolio level. So on the left-hand side, you can see a, um, an index that I put together as part of a research project that shows that if you take the top 100 sustainable real estate investment trusts, you can clearly see outperformance, uh, especially in the most recent years. Uh, the same is true if you look at other kind of more fine-grained sustainability metrics such as the walkability of, um, of the area that uh, green assets are located in. So almost not, like no matter how you slice and dice it, you see green outperformance. And we can have a long debate over the causality of green or whether it's just a whole set of factors that are associated with this. Uh, again, something that we as academics are very careful <laughs> about to attribute causality. Um, I guess the, the other... The flip side of the coin is the risks. So previous slide about the payoff. This is more about the multiple risk dimensions that especially the lower segment, the lower performing segment of the market faces. So multiple risk dimensions from regulatory risks, market risks, physical risks, and technology risks. We don't really have time to, to get into the individual points there, but the point I'm trying to make is there are multiple risk dimensions, and most of these get priced so just to wrap up, I think what we need, um, first of all, the problem as I see it going forward is that we tend to be very additive in our approach to sustainability. So before it was about energy efficiency, now there are new um, kind of trends um, taking over such as health and well-being aspects, such as climate risk and so forth. And they tend to get tagged on to the concept of sustainability without a lot of people actually asking what are the trade-offs. So for example, in, um, in climate risk, when we talk about um, mitigation versus adaptation. So what does adaptation mean? If it means kind of a managed retreat from all the low-lying areas, and think about all the, the cities and commercial real estate assets that go with it, uh, that we would have to basically retreat from, that can't be sustainable, right? Because we are, we'd have to recreate them somewhere else. So simple trade-off questions like that, I think, are still missed. And we still say, okay, now we want to add on uh, climate risk and climate awareness without talking about the, um, really, the trade-offs that need to be made. Uh, another thing is creating a closed system of green investments. Okay, so if there is a green payoff for green premium, where do these profits go? Right. Do they go to buying more private jets, more Ferraris, uh, or is there actually, do they get reinvested? So I think I'm going to end with this because I'm out of time. Uh, George is already showing me the red card. And um, just say we really um, need to improve transparency and data, and that's, that's going to be the key to a lot of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
much, Franz. So now we're going to open up to a panel discussion. So if the speakers would like to take a seat, um, this is the opportunity for the audience to now raise your hand and start asking the hard questions of our esteemed panel. And um, whilst you're all kind of starting to have a bit of a, a think about what you would like to ask, I'm going to start the ball rolling in terms of do you really think there is going to be a time when sustainability would rank on par with financial decision making? So I think we'll just grab one of the microphones. And who would like to start with that team? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> So, um, so Georgie, we would you, you would say you're just asking about um, financial and environmental decision making, um, you know, being on par. So, look, look, I, I think of it this way. Um, I, I'm probably not necessarily the right person to do this because I'm a very financially kind of orientated person, you know, being from EY. But um, you know, it's creeping into all investment decision making right now, and 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 it's it's being pushed. I see, you know, through the investors. So, the investors are saying, well, look, we don't want to go into coal. You know, we don't want to invest in, you know, into tobacco or deforestation or whatever it might be. And I can hear the conversations happening, you know, around the table where they're saying, well. You know, okay, green rated buildings. You know, that might be a little bit at the margin and, and hard to believe. But you know, um, maybe we don't rank some of these assets by their green rating, but maybe we rank them by you know their uh, resilience to climate change. And and if if you've got a portfolio of assets or even an individual asset that isn't particularly um, resilient to climate change, uh, I can see it not even getting to the starting line. So, um, happening right now, probably not from what I'm seeing. Will it happen at some time in the future? Uh, I have very little doubt, very little doubt. Um. Yeah, look, I, I think it's a really, it, it's actually a good question because what it does, it tries to put on an equal footing the considerations of economic versus environmental in a way. And if you think about it, even today, like why we, you know, while we're going to a meeting and say, look, we've got to look at the green credentials, the reality is probably most decisions are made where the weighting is skewed towards the economics. And I say that in this context. So if you're in a meeting and you've got to make a decision, do I buy an asset or not? Well, you know, if, we, if it ticks all the boxes on sort of investment, your traditional investment metrics, then it's a question of sustain. And then you go and say and look at the environmental, well, then it becomes a bit more of a question of degree. Does it need to be six star? I'm just using just one building for an example. Is it a six star building? Does it have to be five star, four star, three star? Where does it need to get to? So I think there needs to be, I think what we need to have is greater transparency of information to try to make a more complete sort of assessment about the environmental assessment um, on an investment. So there's a lot of information on financials and hardcore tangible metrics in that regard, but we probably don't have all the information set or complete information set on the environmentals. If we just go back to what Richard said even about climate change, what do we know, even if we make, need to make a decision about such a broad sort of overlay to, our, to even an investment portfolio, do we really know what all the impacts and what all the flow and effects are going to be? No. So while we probably want to give each part an equal footing or an equal weighting, the reality is there's a deficiency or of information which, are, which prevents us to get there, I suspect. Yeah, you go. Um, I'm really excited to answer this question, which is why our bag's going last. Um, we're currently working on a project where we are building an impact framework that ensures that where we are making investment decisions, the environmental criteria and the social criteria are, are valued and weighted at the same time as the finan financial performance of the asset will be considered. So to get any asset through the gate, I, I'm calling them the gates, I'm making up my own language now, there's a minimum standard, there's a gate, there's got to be a market rate of return, 
but anything above that we can invest in environmental and social performance and that means we've got investors signing up to a platform that says we will consider the improvement of the environment and the improvement of the social impact alongside the financial performance of the asset and I recognise that that is you know these are these are um, investors who are quite ambitious and they're open to new ideas. But that information is then going to flow straight back to my wholesale and listed mandates that we run. Because once I've done the impact model, I'm going to then put it in front of the others and go, well, you have to do this too. So we are now at a space where I can point at a project in writing that has investor signatures next to it that says, we will consider environmental and social and governance and fi financial, did I get that one? All at the same time, which I think is amazing. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, Jeff Robinson from Oricon. Um, I, th I think it's a fascinating time that you're actually putting this uh, discussion on because I think this is such a transitional year. Uh, I'm also interested by the fact that this discussion has been about commercial real estate because that's what you're actually talking about. We're not talking about quality of people's houses or the value of people's houses or anything like that or the quality of the apartments that are build, being built which are part of the if you like real estate and real estate investment that people are making but there's no commentary around where we're going to in sustainability about say apartment buildings why because we're not going anywhere we're going nowhere at the moment and I think a couple of uh, the commentary I'd like to ask you is just about a couple of different things. The first one is that issue about widening the discussion in sustainability beyond kind of chasing zero carbon commercial buildings, which I want to ask you about, but to also go and say, what can we do? What are the investment mechanisms that we can put in place to actually build? better homes and better buildings. Because University of Melbourne's own studies, Chris Jensen's work from a couple of years ago, shows that if you start looking at apartment buildings and you lose the power to them, the current ones, you're into a lot of people in a lot of trouble once we have climate change. So there needs to be a lot of uplift around that. So I'm just interested in getting your thoughts on what you see happening in the next five to ten years in terms of the market demanding better built quality. The first thing is, say, through apartments, and the second thing is whether you think the market is ready to start uh, building commercial buildings that are not glass boxes. Because if we think about where we're heading to at the moment, uh, we've done very well with six star, green star ratings and so on, all that kind of thing. If we want to get to zero carbon buildings, we, then th we have to really focus on things like build quality, air tightness, levels of insulation, where we are not at the races at all if you compare our buildings to buildings that are built in other places. So I'd be interested in your comments on, on those aspects of build quality, whether we can make the next move, and secondly, what you see happening from an investment point of view in the uh, residential sector. Thank you, Nina. Um, hey, that's a good question, um, Jeff. Um, you always ask really good questions, hard ones. Um, I'll start by saying this. Um, the thing about the zero carbon um, sort of building, you know, that's, you know, that's the end goal where you want to get to. The reality is, can we get there today? I would say no. Can we get there in 10 years' time? Probabilistically, I would say no. The, why do I say that? Because I don't think we actually have the technology to get there. Because when you say zero carbon, what you're actually saying is, we need to find a completely new or a different energy source. You don't think so? Well, we don't, well, I'm not sure that, well, the thing is, when you say that, you've got to say that within the context of commercial, right? Because there's a price into this. So the thing is, if you want zero carbon, that might, this is where a lot of the debate is, what is the cost of that? There's a price that you need to pay for that. And if you're saying, well, maybe we can bring that today, but isn't that going to be quite an exorbitant cost? No. Well, it's not? Oh, hang on, so I better leave it, give it back to Nita. <laughs> So energy is not my expertise and Jeff knows way more about this stuff than I do. But um, we've got a net zero target. We're, we're chasing um, 
GPT's net zero 2020. The only way they're going to get to net zero is, is it, at 2020 is that they are going to go wholesale 100% renewables, which means they're out in the market. I think when they issued that media statement to say they were going to be net zero 2020, they'd already done their energy procurement contract. But energy procurement contracts for an organisation like mine where we spend $20 million a year on energy, um, we do that every kind of three to five years, so there's timing around it. But, um, you know, basically once you can get your 100% renewables locked in, that's, you know, 99% of the game won. The other part of that, though, is that there was a report done by ASBEC that said that using today's technology, the real estate sector, so to your point, not just the commercial fancy supermodel buildings, the real estate sector can get to net zero by 2050 using existing technologies. And when you talk about the cost, what's really interesting about that cost is you go, well, when we actually look, so what I've understood recently in getting into this game is going, okay, so when we do financial reviews, a lot of it is actually, uh, there's a bit of gut instinct coming into play that is basic experience saying this is how we value. But when we looked at your whale data, for example, right, so we can de-risk the asset if we've got a net zero building that attracts a kind of tenant. Um, we look at the value differently at the moment. If I want to retain global capital at good you know, with good relationships with investors, we need to have a net zero target and we need to be getting it or we won't have any money. So when you look at it, investors, then entity, then customer, the value proposition moves through that chain. You know, I get that. I, I totally get that. But the thing is, we don't actually know what that value proposition is when we try to articulate that or we try to quantify that. I don't know what that means in terms of a risk premium. I don't think anyone in this room that does. I don't know, can we quantify it in terms of the return premium? Maybe on a return premium we can, but on a risk premium, I don't think we can. I don't think we're there. I think this is why there's a lot of debate. I mean, the, I mean let's leave alone um, so, you know, the whole sort of climate change, but there's a lot of debate even with existing sort of green office buildings, and like we're not even in residential, but just even within the commercial sector, what the true value is, because I think there's a spread there. You know, I mean, so I'm not saying that we can't get there, but there's a, you've got to bed down some of these parameters, and I'm not sure how close we are to do, doing that. Yeah, I think just uh, it's right to ask about the residential sector because 80% of our buildings are residential buildings, not commercial buildings. So if we want to get to those uh, uh, carbon emission targets, it's mainly about residential. Let's not fool ourselves. But at the same time, I think there is a cautionary tale from the UK, which was very ambitious um, seven years ago and said, we want all residential buildings to be net zero, uh, at least in new construction by 2015. The, the target got thrown out. And I think, uh, apart from political considerations, it's also because it was a very, very ambitious target. And I would ask the question, do we really need to make 100% um, of all buildings of the existing stock in the residential market um, net, net zero within the next few years? It's probably not achievable. I think what's, what makes more sense and what's also been implemented in the UK now is to raise the standards gradually and introduce minimum energy efficiency standards and basically say a certain part of the market uh, just won't be able to, to work anymore um, and then gradually raise that level rather than saying, okay, we need, we need to get there within a few years. Um, there are very ambitious targets being thrown out, for example, in, in the US with the, the new Green Deal, that's under consideration. I think it says um, net zero of residential buildings by 2030, which also seems very ambitious, almost too ambitious. So uh, I think there is a trade-off, but the best way and the most pragmatic way to go about it is to raise standards gradually from the bottom and cutting out the, the worst performers, essentially. Yep. And I'd probably like to weigh in as well. Um, so on two, on two points, probably from the residential sector, um, probably the key thing that our research actually found when we examined the ACT market was the role mandatory disclosure has played. So it's been operating in the ACT for 20 years now and it has got a strong value connection, particularly in the sales market. And when we've got the voluntary, uh, or quasi-voluntary as we call it, even though it's mandatory in the rental sector, because it's not being policed and there's a lot of exemptions and ability to get around, 
um, the legislation there in the rental market, we found that the green lemons issue has um, arrived. So in essence, this is a great indicator to the rest of Australia as to how valuable a mandatory disclosure program could be, and we need to actually roll that out across the nation to actually start driving this within the residential sector. And I think what the ACT has provided is a great scenario in terms of, okay, if we kind of leave it a bit loose and a bit voluntary, it's not going to get any traction. Um, so we need to do it quite, I suppose, severely and then think about, in the future, creating minimum standards and driving that through um, to actually upgrade the stock. On the other aspect, in terms of the net zero thing, uh, we need to think about the next level. So. A lot of the focus at the moment is on the operational energy considerations, but we are forgetting about the embodied energy. So we're currently building all these new buildings. You've just got to look at all the skyscrapers in the city. What's the embodied energy and the embodied carbon that we're actually expending in the development of these new buildings? And then consequently, we're not considering some of the, I suppose, renovation projects and all the other carbon that gets emitted in, from an embodied perspective along the life cycle and then to the actual end of life of the asset. So we've got two arguments here. We've got the operational energy as well as the embodied stuff that we need to take account for. And putting my value hat on, it's very much going to have to come from a economic driver perspective. So we need to be able to quantify this in a dollar value uh, consideration, and so that will then help to drive um, better buildings, I think. Next question. Yep. Thanks for that. Uh, Cameron Taylor, National Sustainability Manager with JLL on the Telstra account. And so my job is to get the tenant, Telstra, good sustainability outcomes from the landlord. And I still haven't been to one panel like this in 10 years where there's a representative from a tenant. It's the tenants that pay the rent that funds the whole industry, but the tenants don't have a lobby group or a representation. So they never turn up because they're just busy doing their businesses. We have a few simple metrics for spotting a lemon. 1,600 square metre office, 2,000 square metre warehouse and 5,000 square metre hard stand, about 650 rent, suburban location, 650K. $800,000 electricity bill, lemon, uh -uh. get the landlord to fix it when you negotiate the rent. Major A-grade building, CBD, Melbourne and Sydney, outgoings more than $13 a square metre, uh -uh. lemon, get the landlord to fix it. I mean, what, what's missing in the industry is teaching tenants how to be good tenants and how to get a tenant rep who can negotiate better energy outcomes for the tenant who pays for it all in the, in the long run. So how do we engage tenants in green buildings? Because they're not engaged. If I could just <laughs> say something um, about the, the importance of the tenant. Um, you're saying they are not engaged, yet at the same time, the latest uh, report by, the, um, by Dodge on the, um, the World, uh, World Green Building Council says that it's the number one driver of uh, green real estate, at least in the commercial arena, is not markets, but actually clients and, and stakeholders, essentially. And tenants are also important in that. So that's, that's seen as the number one driver at the moment. Yeah. While the microphone's going to the left, <laughs> I, uh, I think you've completely disproved your own argument, Karen, because you've just told us about the exact benchmarks that you representing tenants know about. Now, I know we're not all at the size that uh, Telstra is in the market and don't have that market data, but, you know, there's a fair whack of the tenants in the market that are that size. And if you just take the federal government and the Victorian government, which I know about best, they have mandated these standards. Um, it is disappointing, I think, that they're not here, and you're absolutely right. In most cases, it is their gross occupancy cost that they are paying for through you know, whether they pay directly, you know, or through the base building. Um, so, you know, if you can do anything, you know, by getting more, you know, the tenants to these types of, um, you know, forums, um, you know, uh, I reckon uh, George has got a next two sessions, one looking at what's happening in the, in the residential market and one up here about, you know, you know tenants forcing it. But um, from my point of view, you know, and I assess the rents, you know, around town for, you know, all different types of tenants, uh, you can bet we're looking at the operating outgoings uh, and energies, uh, you know, a massive one at those. 
Um, so I'm the result of a lot of the, up, the outgoings going up because I come up with all sorts of cockamamie ideas that we're going to run through our assets to engage the tenants. Um, one of which was a crazy idea that we decided to build a green lease guide that used to be a published document. And we thought, no, 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 well, let's put it online and we'll build an online toolkit. So we spent a year building a, an engagement platform around sustainability offices and basically taking 15 years of brain dump and putting it onto a resource to hit that 100,000. What I clocked, which I think is an interesting issue, is that um, you know we host 750 businesses, which might mean we probably have 1,400 contacts in the businesses. But actually, what about the 100,000? So what about you guys in your offices? So it's not just the people we do the deal with, it's actually what about the sustainability champions who are trying to get you know, the water cooler to not have plastic cups? How do we talk to them? Because they're the ones that will then coach the rest of the business to turn the lights off at night. So um, jump online and have a look at it and copy and paste it. So it's at sustainability.investor.com.au. Um, you are very welcome to copy it and give it to your organisation and say, this is the kind of thing we need to be doing. It talks about office fit out and it talks about um, turning the lights off and it talks about sit to stand desks. It also talks a lot about Well, and we've got Jack here from Well. Hi, everybody. This is Jack. Um, and it talks to – our tenants are asking for that stuff, so they don't necessarily – so I think back to your two points. Our tenants are asking for this stuff. They don't necessarily know exactly what it means, but they know they want it because they know it's best in class. So – I think there are conversations happening, but I like your idea of getting tenants up on panels. Um, yeah, I'll make a point as well, I guess. Um, so when, um, just going back to probably when we first put the green index together, one of the, um, you know, we had a round table and one of the key point, discussion points was actually about the tenant and say, well, do the tenants actually understand the value proposition here and in the, in the context of will they actually pay an economic rent that actually incorporates the value of a, of a green building? And, um, and this is what we're sort of, to some extent, the tangibility of sort of the metrics was really all about. Yeah, there's an investment focus and that's fine. You know, the investor may demand it um, and there's an operational focus in terms of, oh yeah, are we going to get sort of a lower outgoings, but in the end of the day, it was all about will the tenant pay a higher economic rent? Because if that's if that's not going to happen, then the whole thing goes to, you know, it doesn't work, right? So you're absolutely right. So, I th and one of the things that we found is that when we actually took the index and we segmented it across market and across sub-markets, we actually found that this spread was actually very different. And what we were able to do, and it wasn't a complete like it's not a complete story, but what we're able to do is sort of understand how that spread changed with the different tenancy profile profile across those sub-markets. So, you know, the A grade prime and A grade market and the prime market would have a different tenancy profile to the B grade, which behaved differently and they had different sort of spreads in terms of what those performance metrics were when you compared it to say, you know, the green style or the neighbours label. So that gave us a bit of an insight to that. And actually what that suggested is and we actually went back to neighbours and said, well, hang on, maybe you should have policy on some of these initiatives which was targeting not the market per se, but the tenancy cohort. Because understanding what those tenancy groups were doing um, and targeting them on the policy, you probably get more, uh, you, you probably get them on board quicker. Anyway. All right, I think we've got time for one more question. Hi, hi everyone, uh, my name is Efe Ozyaba and I'm a lead accredited architect and currently a Master of Property student here at University of Melbourne. My question is, you guys talked about all this change that has been occurring in the past decade, which is great news, but um, how much of this change should be left to the market drives competition, whether it makes money or not, and the regulators, the state, the government, you cannot build that, you should build it this way. What do you think the sweet spot between the, this relationship? I've got the mic, so I'm going to take it. It also happens to be a question that keeps me awake at night. To get the, the right balance between a market-based approach and regulation in some uh, form, uh, I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all answer for all markets and all countries. But I think if we want to get to these targets, we need a multi-pronged approach that works both with market-based approach, where it works. I think that's, that's the first best choice. Um, but the second best and also necessary to get to the targets um, uh, is to apply regulation. And especially apply regulation not to the 
top slice of the top commercial buildings, right, they're going to be fine um, to get to net zero anyways because of all the different drivers, be they from the tenant side, shareholders, and so forth, but for the bottom end of the market. And I think that's where regulation needs to come in. And I think the real estate industry um, has done quite a good job. You have to give them credit for what they've done even without the pressure of regulation. Uh, but I think energy efficiency and the green business case will only take us so far towards meeting those standards. And that's, that's where a bit of regulation, especially to, in the bottom half of the market, will be necessary um, in a kind of sticks and carrots approach. Obviously, when we talk about the, the residential sector, when we up those energy efficiency requirements, the obvious question is, who is going to pay for them? Um, uh, is it going to be the tenants who are basically at the, at the margin of what they can pay anyways? So there you would also need subsidies. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, there is no question that carbon pricing in whatever shape it takes um, is necessary and the industry itself or different industries won't get to the targets that we need. That would be my answer. Um, well, look, I prefer more carrot than stick, to be honest on this one. Um, and, and the reason, but the only thing that I would probably bring to the market if it was on, on the stick side of things would be um, better and uh, more detailed disclosure. Um, I really think that that's how you will get mass change happening out there in the market. I think if we end up with a big stick approach to this, we're going to get embroiled in political discussion about, you know, what is the right way to regulate, um, who pays for it, uh, when is it done, what are the subsidies that are given away. But, you know, we're in a world now where when I started having a look at this, I used to turn up and just talk on the topic of green buildings, and I'm sure three quarters of the audience, you know, didn't, you know, didn't believe climate change was happening, you know. Um, now, you know, it's not a conversation that we have to have anymore. So people are really interested, I feel, in the real estate world at least, and even if it's hard-nosed financial people like myself, in making sure that they make, you know, that they do better, you know. It's part of an all-round decision-making process that's going on around the board tables. So they want to do better, but they need the information and the data to be able to stand at those, at those meetings and say, look, We've got to go this way for this reason and it's the right thing to do and it will happen. And, and, and for, okay, the bigger end of the market where you're dealing with global investors, it's easy to shift the capital. For the smaller end, retrofitting smaller, you know, um, uh, you know residential buildings, it's going to take more time. We kind of get that. Um, you know, but, but um, I, you know, I'm a, I, you know, I, too, much, too much stick and, and I think, you know, we'll end up going backwards for a couple of years. Um, I, I think to date what's the, what the sector has done is it's actually achieved, well it's got to a point in terms of where it wanted to with very little regulation and that's because pretty much the investors, well all the key stakeholders have been on board. As soon as, and, and that's been at the corporate institutional end of the market, so that's actually was maybe the low hanging fruit. That was always going to happen to some extent um, in a less with you know with less sort of resistance now you've sort of got um i guess the secondary grade stock um you've got sectors outside of and look we've only been really been talking about the office sector um so jeff's point's right i mean we haven't really been talking about all the other sectors in resi so as soon as you start bringing them into the game i think it really changes it and it makes it really difficult because i think the social benefits and the social costs especially between resi and commercial are very different. So then how do you regulate that? So, you know, there's, you know, it impacts market pricing differently. So, and I don't think that's fully understood, to be honest. There's a lot of discussion about it, but the reality is, do we really know what all the, imp all the impact or social costs are going to be if we were to regulate completely on the resi market? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I think... The gentleman covered it beautifully. My only other um, ad addition to that answer is that um, I, I do reflect that the commercial industry got it earlier and that was through um, points raised around government driving demand and there were some really good reports on the table that said this thing makes good business sense. And the other sectors haven't had those kickers. Um, they don't have to attract um, sophisticated capital in the same way, so there, there's some market barriers there. But the one that's going to get them is insurance. So the insurance sectors are making big 
big, significant, bolshy moves at the moment and making loud statements about withdrawing from coal. Um, but it's going to get to a point very quickly, and I think we've already seen circumstances in Australia where developments, new housing developments, can't get insurance. So those people can't get mortgages. You know, like it trickles back very, very quickly to say they don't go ahead. So even though, and I think the, the guys are right about the, where, where the stick and the carrot needs to sit, but there's this whole other thing coming, which is, I think, going to dwarf actually the conversation about whether or not you've, your construction code is up to par. And I think the final aspect is that we, I think the commercial sector had the opportunity where we had reach targets. So Green Star came out and they created reach and aspirational objectives in terms of where we could go with buildings. Um, and then we had the mandatory disclosure in the commercial sector come in in terms of disclosing their NABAS ratings. What we're missing in some of the other sectors is that focus, is providing some actual reach targets for um, the residential sector. Sure, there's kind of, you know, the natters that's floating around, but there hasn't been, you know, the marketability, the push or anything like that that has come through in the industry. Um, if anything, some of my research kind of talks, when I talk to homeowners, they're like, oh, it's fantastic, my home's got a six star energy rating. And I'm like, yes, because the builder has to provide that as a requirement under the building code. And so I think there's a lot to be done, certainly within the residential sector. So I think there's an opportunity for both um, in a balanced kind of format. Well, the market's not institutionalised, that's the issue in resi. Hmm. It's private. Yep. So we're just going to round up the session and we can take the discussion outside for uh, drinks and nibbles. But just to kind of finish up, I'd probably like uh, each of the panel members just to kind of note what you think um, is going to be the biggest challenge and opportunity for the market, property and professionals in the future. Uh, well, I can only talk to the commercial sector um, in that that's all we do. We own, only own office buildings. Uh, the biggest challenge coming for me is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. So you can just call that the TCFD for short or the TDIS is what we've been calling it. Uh, that means that I'm getting my head around the financial value at risk to climate change scenarios out to sort of 50 year time horizons. Um, that's the thing that's keeping me up in the middle of the night to work out how on earth I have that conversation with investors without scaring them. Um, <clears throat> I think the, one of the big things is going to be the availability of information. Actually, getting back to Fran's, um, Fran's point about this asymmetry of information, and if you don't have enough disclosure, you're not going to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about a whole lot of different aspects about environmental, and you know, it's, climate change is just one aspect. But, you know, we need a lot more information to make sort of detailed and wise decisions. You know, that's going to be a big, big issue. Uh, biggest uh, risk, I think, will probably be um, the likely detail that we're all going to start seeing pretty soon on what climate change is going to start doing to um, coastal areas and areas that are subject to, to climate change. Um, <coughs> I think a lot of people in this room are going to be quite shocked when they see um, the level of risk that some of our cities are in, uh, not just here but you know globally. Um, the biggest opportunity I think is actually how we think we're going to deal with that um, because uh, we need to get our skates on very quickly because if um, you know we're not going to start reducing carbon and, uh, and carbon emissions, um, we better start getting ready for some pretty horrendous change in the built environment. I would only ask, add one thing to the to the disclosure argument that's already been made, and that's we have to keep in mind that just one percent of all buildings are green certified at the moment. That still leaves ninety nine percent of non certified buildings. What about those? We need to get those on board, and I think that's going to be the huge challenge, and that we have to move beyond labels. And there are actually signs that uh, labels are some labels are flatlining, whereas green building per se is actually. The, the best years are still to come if you trust the, uh, the analysis and the, and the forecasts. So I think uh, that's, that's a big challenge, while at the same time integrating aspects such as health and well-being, which I said are add-ons, but they will get us there because um, I think people will invest in them, especially in, in the residential market, when there are also these additional kind of fuzzier benefits that have been so hard to quantify and yet become major value drivers. Thank you. Excellent. 
So that kind of brings to, to, to the end um, our session for tonight. Thank you all very, very much for coming tonight. So thank you, and thank you to the speakers.